Hello, this is John Cresswell from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. This is another video in the series on mixed methods research. And today I want to talk especially about evaluating the quality of a mixed methods project. What I'm going to do is talk about four features of evaluating the quality. First, I'll talk about how the criteria really depends on the audience that you're uh, presenting your mixed method study to. And then I'll talk generally about the idea of using criteria in mixed methods. I'll set forth some specific criteria that's being used now in the mixed methods research field. And I'll be talking about uh, the latest development in the health sciences where the National Institutes of Health has now come forward with some best practice recommendations. When we think about the quality of research, it really depends on the particular outlet, the audience that will be evaluating the research. We know that journals often set forth the criteria for how reviewers should review manuscripts for publication. We know that graduate faculty and faculty in colleges and universities often have their own criteria for what they would feel constitutes a good research project. Funding agencies have review criteria both for submitting an application for funding as well as reviewing a, an application. And even book companies uh, look at proposals for new books using a set of quality criteria. So all of these different standards would apply not only to any publication that is going forward, but also to mixed methods research. The question often comes, why should we have, or should we even have, uh, standards in mixed methods research? And I want to review a few of the pros and cons on both sides of this, this picture. First, those arguments for having standards well, we do know that reviewers that review journal articles need some standards. And often there's a large collection of reviewers uh, that are available to review manuscripts that come into journals. And so editors feel that there needs to be some standard that all of these reviewers might use as they assess manuscripts. So that there's some high quality assessment going on for all the reviews. We also know that faculty committees often bring in standards for what they, they feel should be a good doctoral dissertation or a master's thesis or a research report. In fact, it's not unusual for a faculty member to hand a copy of their favorite dissertation to a new doctoral student to see how the project needs to be laid out. We also know that funding agencies like standards and especially the federal agencies that are reviewing applications. Uh, so NIH, the National Science Foundation, the Institute for Educational Sciences, all of these have some standards that they use in reviewing projects being proposed for funding. We know that in the health sciences, the use of standards or set procedures is pervasive. Uh, the protocol for how to deal with a patient disease, the protocol that goes on in a hospital setting that needs to be followed. So it's not unusual to have standards and protocols and checklists available in the health sciences. In a group that I think particularly profits from having standards of quality would be beginning researchers. They often want to know well, how do I do this research and what's the best way I can do it and so they'll be calling for more and more standard procedures for how to do mixed methods research. On the other side, the cons, the areas where there's some question about whether standards are valuable. One of the issues that often people raise is who decides what the standards are going to be? Because that gives tremendous power to those that are actually creating the standards and whether they're qualified to create those standards. Furthermore, some people would argue that standards tend to limit what can be done with the methodology, limit creativity, 
limit innovative new ideas because people are responding to specific standards. I would have to say the group that dislikes standards too it would be more experienced researchers. They know the basics. They know what's expected. Now they want to be creative and innovative in their research. And so they're less likely to embrace standards. And finally, some people say that really it's hard to forge any agreement on what the standards would be. For example, in a leading article in the mixed methods field by Johnson and Anwabuzi and Turner, they talked about how there were 19 different mixed methods writers asked for their definition of mixed methods research. And they came up with a very diverse set of even definitions of what this methodology is all about. So the idea of getting an agreement on what the standards should be is often in question. Well, I spoke about standards being used in journals, and it might be helpful to turn to the journal that I co-founded back in 2007, the Journal of Mixed Methods Research. When we set up standards for this journal, we basically had in mind submissions that would be in two categories. One would be empirical articles, where uh, authors actually present a research study using mixed methods procedures. And the second would be methodological articles where people write about the method of mixed methods research, how to conduct research, how to validate the research, the ethical issues, the types of designs. And so this page setting forth the basic criteria uh, in terms of these two types of manuscripts that were reviewed can be seen. In the empirical side, uh, we, we asked that the manuscript fit a basic definition of mixed methods of research, integrate the two databases, and talk about how it would add to the literature. In terms of the methodological articles, it needed to address an important topic, uh, adequately incorporate the literature and actually contribute to advancing the field of mixed methods research. We went further then to specify criteria that reviewers might use when a manuscript came into our office. And here you can see the review criteria for an, both the empirical article and the methodological article. And the empirical article you'll see on this list uh, it needs to talk about the problem, the framework, the questions, the design, sampling, you know, many of the uh, major research points need to be included. In the methodological article, it needs to address an important topic, bring in the literature, make sound arguments, have high writing quality, and actually contribute to the mixed methods field. So here you see the specific criteria. Now, I would have to say that this journal was new and we felt that there needed to be specific uh, items that reviewers, that people submitting manuscripts might need. And so this is a fairly detailed list of review criteria for both types of articles. But of course in setting standards and, and criteria for evaluating the quality in our journal, it's not an unusual situation to have standards available throughout the literature. And so on this slide, I show you some of the standards. For example, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation put together standards for qualitative research. Uh, and there's an uh, example here of their website. And the uh, USAID organization wrote an article about tips for what would constitute a good mixed methods article. The National Science Foundation uh, put out in 2002 a user-friendly handbook on evaluation. And in there you have a rather substantial section on the quality criteria for mixed methods research. Specific fields are developing standards for mixed methods, such as this one article you see in the middle on medical education. And then different funding agencies are coming up with standards, such as workshops on interdisciplinary research in uh, different fields, such as social work and in uh, dissemination implementation studies. 
So at these workshops, people are advancing what they feel are quality indicators for mixed methods research. I might mention that while I served as editor of the co-editor of the journal Mixed Methods Research, I probably looked through over 300 mixed methods manuscripts that came across my desk. And so I thought I would talk about what I personally looked for in these mixed method studies that would make them high quality. I wanted a research I wanted a study that addressed a research problem where it was important to gather both quantitative and qualitative data to address this problem. Then I would go into the method section and I would look specifically for examples of the researchers collecting both quantitative and qualitative data. I would look throughout the manuscript to see how they were actually integrating the two databases. I would want the study to be rigorous both on the quantitative methods and the qualitative methods. And I wanted them to think about or at least raise the possibility of their procedures fitting within one of the mixed methods design, so whether it was a basic design or a more advanced design. And then finally, I wanted to find out if the authors mentioned recent mixed methods literature, some of the latest books, some of the latest articles. So I would turn to the reference list at the end of their article to see if I saw any of these. Now the federal government has been interested in mixed methods research. That example of the National Science Foundation is a good illustration. Their standards on evaluation and their inclusion of a section on mixed methods research. Back in 1999, the National Institutes of Health actually came up with some guidelines for qualitative methods in health research. This was put together by a panel of researchers. If you look closely at this 1999 guideline, you will see a section on what they called combining quantitative and qualitative research. So they started this process of developing recommendations for how to do mixed methods research in 1999. In 2010, the National Institute of Health, specifically the Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research, and here you can see uh, their website pay, main page. They commissioned a group, and there were 18 of us, to work on what's been called the best practices for mixed methods research in the health sciences. This was a group that, that operated for about a year working on these recommendations. It was made up of project officers from NIH. Uh, it was made up of mixed methods researchers. It was made up of administrators from the Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research. And we met during the year and actually came up with some guidelines for conducting mixed methods research. It was called Best Practices. And as you can see in this outline of the table of contents, it began with first a discussion about what is mixed methods research and why is it needed in the health sciences. And then it moved into more specific topics, such as how to write an application for an R award or a K award or a center grant award, and how researchers might tailor their application to include good mixed methods features. And towards the end of this report, there is a checklist that I'm going to show you here in a minute that talks about the criteria that evaluators might use as they assess applications that include mixed methods research. So this report was first developed in hard copy and then it went up on a website in August of 2011 and it's been one of the most heavily hit websites in the Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research history. So there's been quite a bit of interest, interest shown in this and it's spawned several workshops at NIH to follow up on this. So I'm going to show you the table that's specifically from this website, this document. This is a table of the review criteria that a person would use to review an application for funding at NIH. And so the topics that one would consider in their review would be the significance, the role of the investigators, the innovativeness, 
of the study, the approach used by the researchers, and the environment in which the potential funding might be given to. What's interesting about this list, if you look closely, this is uh, a list of criteria that might be used as a checklist that incorporates some of the major features of mixed methods research. For example, the rationale for multiple perspectives. What are the mixed method skills, both quantitative and qualitative, of the investigators? The leadership for the project, and whether this person has a wide skill set and knows how to lead a meeting where there might be people of different methodological persuasions. Uh, how collaboration exists among members of a team doing research. What the advantages of mixed methods research might be and why integration is important. These are some of the factors that began to appear in this checklist and were uh, embraced by our working group and now are out there for people to use as they evaluate, as they prepare their application for funding and for reviewers as they review projects for funding. So as we step back and look at this overall question of how to evaluate the quality of a mixed method study, we need to acknowledge that there's different criteria depending on the audience that some people believe in standards and others do not. So the idea of using criteria is somewhat controversial. We also need to see that there has been some criteria emerge in mixed methods research through publications, through journal articles, through workshops, and that now the federal government has gotten involved in setting forth major quality criteria in the new best practices for mixed methods and health sciences uh, website and document that sets forth what these practices might be. Thank you.